Welcome everyone to How Can We Heal Our Local Waters in Montgomery County. Uh, we have some special speakers tonight. And uh, first of all, uh, or I want to introduce the first one to uh, let you know at toward the end of this webinar, we'll have some uh, local organizations who also have resources for you to take action. So um, stick around and we look forward to hearing from them. I'd like to introduce uh, Paul Modrell, who is the Rainscapes Planner and of Watershed Restoration Division in the Department of Environmental Protection of Montgomery County. And uh, Paul is going to talk about uh, how we in congregations can um, help prevent and address stormwater pollution uh, in Montgomery County. Take it away, Paul. I thank you, Colia, for um, the introduction. And for the opportunity to um, share some information about um, our Rainscapes program. Um, I'm Paul. I'm a planner with um, Montgomery County Rainscapes. And uh, this is a program that provides rebates and, or reimbursements to property owners, private property owners, and um, institutions like you know, Houses of Worship, they, they qualify, uh, to install one or more of six different types of stormwater best management practice or BMP. And that's just the technical jargon or, or regulatory uh, term for a rainscape. So we call them rainscape. Um, the purpose of the rainscapes program is to, to capture and filter as much stormwater on site as possible so that less water and cleaner water runs off to our local streams and ultimately to the Chesapeake Bay. So we're trying to um, allow less to escape our properties. And if it does, um, uh, we hope that it is cleaner um, by implementing some of these, these features. Uh, so next. Um, hmm, I think we might have skipped a slide. Um, I have a good slide. Can we go down one more? Maybe they got jumbled up. Hmm. No, I'll we'll have to go back. Because I had a nice um, illustration Hmm. of what the, the rainscapes look like. Oh. Um, it was a diagram. Okay. And it's a, uh, basically, it just shows a, a house, a typical property, uh, with uh, all six of the different rainscapes um, uh, that, we, uh, that we support. And the first one being a conservation landscape. Hmm. Um, a conservation landscape looks like a regular um, landscaped area, garden area. Uh, but the difference is um, it, uh, it's a little more intensely um, uh, worked. Uh, the soil is turned over to a depth of nine inches. We add compost to the soil and then we plant it really densely. Uh, we add more plants than you would normally um, plant a, a landscape. Uh, and then we top it off with, uh, with mulch and we include mostly native um, plants, plants that are native to Maryland or the, the mid-Atlantic area. Um, because they're best suited for this environment and for the wildlife that depend on them. Um, and that's our most, um, our most popular uh, type of rainscape, um, or choose the, the conservation landscape than any other, um, than any other measure. <clears throat> um, and it has a lot to do because it's with uh, the fact that it's, it's easy to install and um, it's easy to understand and it's very flexible. Uh, the next most common is the rain garden might be familiar with those. They look the same on the surface or very similar, um, but really the uh, rain garden's a little bit different in that it's a more of a basin. You excavate um, to up to three feet deep, turn that soil over, add compost, and that creates a lot more pore space to soak up a lot more water. And then there is a berm that rings it um, that gives you six inches of standing water. So the idea is to catch water um, flowing over land or from your, your rooftop um, and try to soak all of that into the, the landscape or as much as possible. Um, it can overflow and into the rest of your landscape, but mm -hmm. the, the idea behind the rain garden is to temporarily pond and sink in that water, that storm water. Um, another uh, type of rainscape or a measure that we would um, we support are um, rain barrels or cisterns. They're pretty much the same thing. A rain barrel um, is usually about 50 to 55 gallons. Cisterns are much larger, and uh, but they both collect um, 
uh, uh, runoff from your roof through the downspout and uh, they store it and you can reuse that water. Um, another thing is a, a green roof. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't get a lot of these applications, but we, we do help uh, offset the cost of green roofs. Um, they are probably the most expensive uh, measure. Uh, they're definitely the, the most interesting um, I love to see the green roofs, but um, they're a little expensive as well. Uh, you have to hire architects and engineers to make sure your structure can hold the extra weight of a green roof. Um, but uh, when implemented, they're absolutely um, stunning and they work great. There is a green roof at uh, Epworth United Methodist Church uh, in Gaithersburg, for those of you who want, might want to see it. <laughs> All right. Um, actually, I haven't seen that yet myself, so I might uh, get over there. <laughs> so, um, and we do have a couple more measures uh, that we are rainscape types. Um, one is a, um, uh, a permeable paving, and it's mm -hmm. usually installed in the driveway to replace a concrete or asphalt driveway. Um, but these are pavers that have spaces between. Uh, there's room in the joints for the rainwater to mm -hmm. just flow straight down. The, the rainwater does not flow off the surface and onto the street. It could seek straight down and into um, what's essentially an aquifer that you construct underneath um, that, uh, that paved uh, surface. Uh, it's a gravel um, uh, base that acts like an aquifer and it soaks up all the, the stormwater, the rainwater. And, and lastly, we um, provide uh, reimbursements for um, just pavement removal. If you have a uh, pavement that's really not serving a, a purpose anymore, it's just not serviceable, it's all cracked and broken up. Um, if you're looking for more garden space or, or lawn space, you can remove that, replace it with turf or preferably conservation landscape and we'll, we'll uh, reimburse you for uh, some of that cost, that expense. Um, so what are the benefits of this? So that catches me up to the current slide. <laughs> I was just going to uh, click ahead, just to try and click ahead and just see if it maybe it was somewhere else. But yeah, uh, I don't know how that um, didn't make it oh, in there. OK, but, uh, all right. <laughs> Sorry about that. OK, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the benefits of rainscapes, there's just so many. Uh, but uh, on top of you know storm water protection and um, treatment, um, they, they can beautify, beautify, <clears throat> excuse me, beautify your landscape. Mm -hmm. um, reduce drainage and erosion problems on site. Oftentimes there's ponding water, uh, basement uh, water issues and or erosion problems that can actually be solved uh, through rainscapes, uh, installing the rainscapes. Um, uh, if uh, you're replacing lawn, there's gonna be a lot less time and expense uh, devoted to uh, caring uh, for that part of your landscape. Uh, there's a lot of mowing and edging and, and herbicide application and whatnot. Um, two lawns and you won't have to do that anymore uh, with a rainscape. Um, if um, you include trees and large shrubs, you can definitely help um, you know, mitigate uh, your cooling and, and heating uh, costs for your house. You can um, insulate your house in the winter and uh, shade it in the summer with uh, conservation landscaping or, or rain gardens uh, that include trees and, and large shrubs. Um, you can minimize the expense uh, of a typical landscape, much like a lawn. Um, typical landscapes require a little more maintenance, a little more input, um, oftentimes because you're, you're planting things that aren't native to this environment. So they require a little more care to, to keep them going. Um, if you plant with natives, uh, they, they tend to do just fine if they're planted in the right uh, place. Um, and um, uh, another benefit is that uh, just the active stewardship um, of a property just inspires more, um, you know, stewardship and uh, results in just better communities. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, next slide. So um, the Rainscapes uh, program is, is fairly generous. Uh, there aren't too many other programs that offer uh, what we offer, um, which is up to $20,000 per uh, institutional property. Um, uh, or uh, 7,500 for, uh, for residential. Um, 7,500 is a lot less, but it's still, I think, the, the highest rate you're going to find for a residential um, uh, rebate program. Mm -hmm. um, Excuse me, may I ask a question? Sure. 
Um, I had heard recently that the um, that there was a backlog of Rainscape applications and that the program was not currently taking new applicants. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, through popular demand, um, we've exceeded our, our capacity to process any more applications. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that uh, so many people have been home um, these past six or more months and um, yeah. <laughs> we've had more time, um, and uh, but we've had a, a huge uh, response and uh, a record number of, uh, we received a record number of applications. So we've, we've had to, to pause temporarily and uh, we will resume um, intaking more applications beginning in mm -hmm. February, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's, a, it's a pause. But if you are interested in um, a rainscape in this, this coming year, uh, now is really a good time to start planning. You can mm -hmm. actually start preparing a, um, your landscape plan and gathering a plant list. And and, uh, um, and so that by the time um, February comes around, you'll be um, ahead of the game and be willing to, or ready to, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, I guess progress a little bit faster. Yeah. So you wouldn't actually lose a whole lot of time at this point in the year um, if you were to be ready before you actually applied uh, uh, coming up. So that's, that's a great question. I am going to ask folks to save your questions till after the presenters are all finished and type and you can type your questions into the chat too. Well, we will be sure to uh, address them. Uh, but we're um, needing to move on. So um, let's, okay. uh, let's go ahead, Paul. Sure. Um, so there's just one more point I wanted to make. Um, and that was that uh, with the last slide, and that is we offer these rebates um, but not everyone in the county um, uh, can take part in this program. There are a few cities that uh, did not, um, or that, that opted out, and that is uh, Tacoma Park, Rockville, and I think Gaithersburg, but they do have their own programs. So um, if you're interested in installing something like this, uh, check with them, um, and uh, they may actually still be um, open for, for applications at this point, but uh, you'd have to go through your local uh, city. Um, so uh, this, this slide, we're, we're trying to get to the potential impacts of, of, of Congress. I think what it's trying to say is that there are 519 um, congregations of all faiths in uh, Montgomery County. Uh, so far, we've got 31 of them to enroll and and uh, install projects, rainscapes on their properties. Um, but if we could get everyone to, to uh, install rainscapes on all their potential um, you know, area, uh, we, could, we could transform potentially 2,970 acres or 4.6 square miles of land. Um, so that's a lot of habitat. That's a lot of gardens. That's a lot um, of um, environmental measures, and uh, it's a lot more uh, clean water. So um, congregations can have a big impact uh, on our overall uh, water quality and mm -hmm. environmental health. So more specifically, what can a, a congregation, or I mean, what can Rainscapes do for, for congregations? Um, they can help you gather the community, um, they can focus around, uh, say, a rain garden or a conservation landscape. Um, they can help uh, create a, a more welcoming atmosphere. Um, landscaping has that ability. Um, it can provide a, an outdoor place of worship. It helps heal the environment, inspire stewardship, and uh, can help us celebrate creation a little more. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and I'm just going to run through some examples really quickly. So here's the next slide. We've had uh, Melvin G. Berman Hebrew Academy. Um, uh, yeah, uh, my cursor does work. So that's, I'm not sure if you can see the cursor, but uh, you can see that uh, there's this, a downspout mm -hmm. is discharging to a conservation landscape through a dry riverbed or creek bed that uh, wraps around the building and, and uh, discharges to a conservation landscape um, where the plants are absorbing that water. Um, at Grace Episcopal Church, they've installed a large, um, uh, a large rain garden that collects water from their their driveway and uh, their part of their parking lot, um, and it fills up during storms and sinks that water in. Next page. Okay. Uh, Adat Shalom has installed a, a few different measures: some rain barrels and 
conservation landscaping behind their building by the uh, playground. And out front, they've added um, a pollinator garden to their county required stormwater detention basin. And that's the picture in the upper right Oops, corner. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. But uh, we got the point there where yeah. instead of just grass, it's, it's full of um, uh, pollinating, uh, pollinating plants. So uh, Silver Spring United Methodist, they've also installed some conservation landscaping in front and I think around the back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next. Um, and this is an interesting example and you're gonna see more of it, I think, with the video coming up yeah. sometime during this um, workshop. Mm -hmm. But St. James installed a, a conservation landscape, and that inspired their neighbors at Beth Shalom to um, uh, go a little bit farther. They actually got a, a grant, a sizable grant, to do a much larger project. Um, that's the, the project on the left, where you see it looks like a, a gravel pathway or, or dry creek bed and conservation landscape takes a lot of water from a, a large uh, uh, parking lot and filters it through uh, that conservation landscape. And next, Colesville Methodist Church has a, a, a nice well-kept um, rain garden out front. It takes um, a, a water from a downspout coming off the corner of that building. You see in the lower right corner of the slide. Um, the, uh, the water flows under a, a pathway and emerges in the green, uh, uh, the rain garden mm -hmm. and uh, fills it up during storms. Great. And this is the last slide uh, with, uh, with example. And this is um, Brookmont Church and they installed rain barrels in all their downspouts all the way around. And they did a good job of screening them and uh, mm -hmm. the rain barrels um, are very effective and uh, capturing that water and slowly releasing it into the landscape of water uh, during the dry periods. Great. And uh, and these are just some resources. Uh, so if you're interested, if we can convince you to um, uh, uh, install your own rainscapes at your um, uh, uh, your house of worship, um, we've got uh, resources for you. If you go to the link at the very top, we have a, a special page for congregations. Um, and in that page, you can find a, uh, um, a link to um, our, our booklet, Rainscapes for Congregations, which helps you, um, you know, plan and prepare and install um, your, your rainscapes. Uh, we also have a very inspirational video called Sacred Waters. Uh, you can find that on that page or on um, YouTube. And there's a YouTube link there that you can type in to, to find it. Um, and uh, not having to do with um, our, our web page, at the bottom there is the EPA's Saving the Rain mm -hmm. Stormwater Solutions for Congregations. That is a recent publication. It's a, a publication. It's uh, been in the works for years and it was just released in June. And um, the Rainscapes program um, did actually influence it pretty, uh, pretty much. Um, uh, Ann English, our program manager, uh, did a lot of work to uh, help guide uh, development of it. And I think that's even a, a Montgomery County rainscape on the front cover of this national publication. So, right. Um, yeah, that's a wonderful resource. Yeah. And I think I've just got the last slide, which is um, uh, maybe there's one more after this. But uh, yeah, once you've installed your, um, your, your rainscape at your congregation, you know, you're always welcome to reapply for your own property um, mm -hmm. and see if you can. Uh, uh, replicate some of that at your own home. Great. So yes. I think that's the end of this this uh, presentation. That's great. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, we like to say go forth and do likewise once you've done it on your congregation grounds so that, that your congregation grounds are actually modeling what you hope the, uh, the wider community will do. Right. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, well, thank you. And here's Paul's information. And um, again, as I said at the beginning, uh, this uh, Webinar will be is being recorded so that uh, all this information will be posted on our website. So now uh, I'm delighted to be introducing uh, a video that we uh, produced. This is a uh, video of a site visit uh, at the uh, churches, uh, church and and synagogue that was mentioned earlier, St. James Episcopal Church, and. Um, uh, Beth Shalom Synagogue. So 
I'm going to show that video now. It's as if you were going to a, a faithful green leaders training, you would uh, actually in person, you would see a site visit, but we can't do that anymore. So we produced this video as a way to, to actually travel around a particular project, the Interfaith Greenway. And we're delighted that um, Susie Altman is, uh, is attending tonight, uh, who designed this beautiful project. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to uh, segue to that. And you'll see in it, after the opening slides, you know, some of the problems that were being, that being addressed in terms of the stormwater runoff and then uh, we'll hear what the solution was. So it's about a 10 minute video and it's a very thorough walkthrough of uh, the project and all of the installations and why they are there and the functions that they perform. And you'll see it's beautiful too. It's a, a wonderful way of converting a, what was uh, an area that was not very well utilized. <clears throat> And here you see the signage, a beautiful sign that explains for all those who visit uh, the whole uh, project, its design and its purpose. And the presenters are Susie Altman, uh, the designer of this project, uh, and Anne English, who is from Rainscapes. Basically, stormwater starts right here. And the project that you're gonna see at the Interfaith Greenway uh, collects all the water from these parking lot and the, all the roofs of this huge building. Uh, the roof has uh, like downspouts that are uncovered and they're all channeled to these huge drains. And then the- Whoops, oh my goodness, what happened? I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, let's go back. I apologize, I don't know what happened there. Uh, like downspouts that are uncovered and they're all channeled to these huge drains and then the drains are going under the asphalt into the area that we're going to see uh, at the interface greenway so what you're seeing here is a sample rain garden it's part of the treatment plan that you're going to be seeing all along the interface greenway uh, the reason this rain garden is here it's basically collecting the water, the sheet flow that is coming from that huge parking lot, which is another congregation, the Baptist Church, and the grass. It's it's so the rain garden is trying to collect the water and sink it in here and also clean the pollutants that are coming from the cars and from the air and from all the different dust that we've got. So this entire area was all full with uh, invasive plants like um, in English ivy and poison ivy and there were a lot of um, shrubs that became trees that were very invasive and you basically could not use this area because it was very dangerous. Uh, there were critters and uh, you know snakes and everything was around here so the, the congregation could not use the area. We cleaned it up and we basically put here uh, plants that are all native and they're creating an entire uh, new atmosphere and ecosystem and uh, also it's important to understand that we have the water is running under here and we'll see where it goes afterwards. It's important to point that we are in a residential area and there are neighbors that were concerned about water going into their yards. So we utilized, we reused every single uh, piece of dirt or a cubic feet of dirt that was on that other side. And we created berms here so that we could raise uh, the height of the uh, plants that we were bringing in. And you can tell that there is there are, there are different grades of plants, like taller plants that will cover the um, fence and they will give screening, acoustic screening and visual screening. Uh, to uh, congregation from the residential area uh, and there is the lower area plants and this was intended to be a shade garden, a showcase for uh, native ferns, native um, colony, turtle head, and 
they don't have plants. And uh, there's uh, other um, Achillegia, there's other plants that are native that are wonderful and they can um, coexist together in a shade location like this one. So there is a huge pipe that it's running underground and you cannot see, but it comes, uh, the outflow of that huge uh, amount of water is coming to this concrete pipe or culvert. And it used to be flowing before we started the project uh, in a straight line without any sort of filtration or slowing down or, or uh, cleaning or anything. It was going in a straight line towards the Montgomery County sewer um, hutch basin inlet that is shown over there. So here where I'm standing, it's exactly uh, the boundary line between two different congregations, the Shalom congregation and St. James. And as you see, it, it's an Im imaginary line that um, you can't tell, but it, it made the two congregations come together and uh, rethink the space and reutilize the space for their two basic two uh, nursery schools that are functioning here from Monday to Friday um, all year long, summer camps, and then the congregations have um, people that come either Saturdays or Sundays uh, to each one of the buildings and they use this public space for leisure, for contact, and basically it's a showcase of our wonderful native uh, plants that we've got in the mid-Atlantic area. So there is uh, two different places. Um, called patios but underneath uh, there is a huge dry well and it's basically an excavation that collects the rainwater uh, and then once it stops raining it uh, evaporates and spirates or part of that water goes into the um, water table uh, but it's being used as a storytelling place for the uh, preschool kids and it's also used during uh, services for you know the people that are that can't be at services they can just hang out here so there is one dry well circular dry well here and we're slowly going to see another one uh, the two dr main dry wells are being uh, connected by this um, path that you can see um, that are also they were dug up and filled in with gravel and they also absorb a lot of the water that we need to basically capture inside but these uh, pathways serve as exploration for the little ones uh, and also for big people to uh, approach the plants and get to smell the plants get to see the bees um, from like a, a short distance and look at the beautiful butterflies everything that's going on here that you can't tell if you're far away so here's the second uh, round dry well that was created and it's always used as a place for meditation or for storytelling. Whoever uh, wants to come here is invited. This is invi uh, also open to the entire community, um, residential, like people, homeowners come here and, and just hang out here. I'm Ann English. I'm the coordinator of the Rainscapes program for Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection. What you've been walking through with Susie has been a great grant project that was funded through the Water Quality Protection Charge and involved a lot of partners with the neighbor and the, the two congregations agreeing to share space to manage stormwater. We're the agency for the county that reports to the state on the conditions of our water quality through our MS4 permit system, which is stormwater that has a pollution load in it that we are charged with removing a certain percent. One of the great things about this project is you can see so many different types of things. You saw a rain garden, you saw a swale, you saw a dry well, you saw the social space and the native plants all being featured in this beautiful treatment train that is cleaning the water before it gets a chance to go into this outfall. It goes into this inlet and then it'll go into a pipe system to a stream. But before it went into the stream, it had a chance to be cooled and cleaned and create beauty and a wonderful space for the congregations. 
So we're standing here at St. James Episcopal Church um, and there is this gorgeous rain garden and also conservation landscaping in between two buildings, uh, the church and the parish hall. And um, this congregation was very much concerned with all the water coming from their parking lot long time ago and streaming down into this parking lot and it created ice and it was a threat for the safetyness of the pedestrians in the cars. So this rain garden was dug up a lot. I think more than two feet. Like it was like to the maximum. We hit like the underground pipes um, so that it collected a lot of water because the space was very limited. And there are some other conservation landscaping areas also that are connected. And so they're like thought to capture a bit of water before they hit the rain garden and before they go into the parking lot. So this is a site that actually has four rainscapes rebate projects. The first three, the dry well, the rain garden, and the first conservation landscaping area were done through the rebate program as a match to a separate outside grant that was through the CBT. This grant and, and rebate then ultimately covered the full cost. Later, the, the community uh, decided they wanted to do another rebate project and they did the conservation landscape below the front door to St. James. As Susie said, this was a very tight space and one of the tightnesses is why there's a dry well on the other side of the sidewalk that you don't see taking the downspout water off of that roof into a dry well before it is allowed to bring, be brought over into the rain garden. It was an icing hazard, it's an older uh, congregation, and this is, uh, I, we believe, really helpful for safety. In addition to the beautiful plants you see behind me, if you were to walk around it, you would also see swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed, which is monarch support, which has been in place now since 2011. So this garden has been supporting pollinators for a very long time and helping this congregation live out their values. Well, we hope you've been inspired by seeing all the beautiful work that's been done here as a result of this collaboration between two congregations to care for God's sacred waters and prevent stormwater runoff, which we know is the number one source of urban and suburban water pollution. And these projects are just some examples of what you can learn about working with IPC, Interfaith Partners of the Chesapeake, and come to one of our Faithful Green Team trainings learn how your green team can be strengthened and built to take such actions as these and learn more about getting funding and do what we can to restore God's creation. So that's uh, somewhat of a taste of what a site visit would have been if we had been in person uh, attending a training. Um, I'm now going to quickly turn it over to Larissa Johnson, who uh, is with the resident Residential Energy Program of uh, the uh, Montgomery County Energy Client and Climate Compliance Division. <laughs> uh, take it away, Larissa. Thank you for joining us and uh, sharing uh, what oh, your program, program has to offer. Sure, so I'm excited to chat with y'all today because we have a relatively new program and I'm not sure everyone knows about it. Uh, it is focused on residential, but of course we are more than happy to work with congregations. I know I am working with my congregation personally, Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Rockville on their green team and bringing events to the congregation like light bulb exchanges. We did one this Nope, we did one last, nope, when did we do one? Sometime when we were all in person. No idea when it was because I have no idea what day it is anymore. <laughs> You're lucky I'm here, who knew? All Thank right, you. so <laughs> so Montgomery Energy Connection is basically the result, it's not basically, it is the result of, oh, it's late, man. All right, it's the result of the Pepco Exelon merger that happened a few years ago. And so with that funding, we, we, as a county were uh, told that we needed to spend this money on outreach and education to residents. And so through that, we brought a bunch of partners together in 2017. And the biggest thing that people asked for was a website. 
So we created <laughs> created a website and kind of like a network called Montgomery Energy Connection, where everything energy related is all in one place, as opposed to 17 to 30 different websites, which is where we literally got all this information from. So I like to make it a little interactive. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. That's okay, right? If they unmute themselves for a second. What, sure. what does it mean to conserve energy? Don't be shy now, anybody? <laughs> um, to look at your input and output and decide that there's a way to reduce the amount of energy you're using. In other words, data. Oh, I like data. Yeah, we could use data. Can you press enter? I think it hopefully only comes up one answer. Uh, yeah, this is, or conservation, conserving energy is when we use less energy. I, Vaughn, I need you to come work for me because I need to <laughs> talk about metrics and data. And I'm, I, it, I just go, so, so, so. anyway, but metrics. Yeah, so, <laughs> yes, metrics, I do. Um, yes, but when we talk about conservation, this is the number one thing that we talk about through Montgomery Energy Connection is conservation because the cheapest form of energy is the energy we do not use, of course. Really difficult right now since we're all in our homes, we're on computers for everything. Every social interaction we have right now is connected to our outlet, which means we're using a lot of electricity. So conservation is what happens when we use less energy turning off lights, uh, taking five minute shower. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh -oh. giving them the answer. You're giving them the answer. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. The go answer. Back, go back, go. So, <laughs> you can see that, right? <laughs> so the difference between, you can press it again, the difference right. between energy conservation and energy efficiency. So this is what we always mm. try to talk to people about because there's a little bit of confusion or we sometimes use these words interchangeably and they are different. So Energy conservation is when we use less energy and energy efficiency is when we don't waste energy. So that fawn is more like data driven, right? So how much energy are you, you using with an incandescent light bulb versus how much energy you're using with an LED light bulb? So you know, I, can I ask, can I interject something? We just had a rainscaping program. Yes. And this direct relates to what you're talking about because there's now this di discussion about daylighting how stormwater is treated and moved through the landscape. Yeah. So in a sense, it's like dataizing and exposing how your metering can give you a better way to use energy. Yeah. And I thought that daylighting was a great, anyway, I'm sorry yeah. for interrupting, yeah. but it, just, no, I love that like it all fits yeah. together in my mind. <laughs> oh, yes, Thanks, Fawn. that's what I want to hear, Fawn, is yeah. how it all fits together. Because a lot of times people are like, why are you speaking at an event where we're talking about rainscapes and water? Everything is connected. Y'all know this. And mm -hmm. especially because we're all in our homes using so much electricity. This past October, it was Energy Action Month. And so what we did was every week during, during October, I partnered with a different division of, De of DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. So we talked about the connection between energy and water, energy mm. and lawns, energy and recycling. Oh. Mm. So every week we did that. And so for energy and water, we did a clogging event, which has been so successful. If you go out to any park in Montgomery County right now, you may see a sign about plogging. Plogging mm. just means picking up trash as you're walking and jogging. And we're encouraging that one as a way for us to be more physically active to get more energy Themselves. Yeah, it's a new it's a new concept, Fawn. It's um from Sweden. It's a Swedish word, plucka, P L O C K A. But anyway, so all that to say, there are always connections. Energy is connected to every single thing we do, and that's why we're talking about that today. The other thing is, this is a slide about what the average cost of utilities are. This is in a home. This is a four-person home, and this is in the country. So you can see how it's broken down. And again, I'm trying to make connections between electricity and the other utilities that we have in our home. Most of them, so when we talk about water, when, you're, you, when you take a shower, however long that shower is, that shower is not only using water, but it's also using electricity to heat up that water, unless you like to take cold showers and you do the, draw, the, Hoff, the Hoffman breath or whatever that is. You, take, you like to go into the ice. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so th there's a connection between all of these things. So I just want you to think about that. So I, when I talk to folks, I'm always like, do you know how much you're paying for all of these things and how it breaks down and how they're all connected? Internet, we can't have internet without electricity, cable TV, not without electricity, you know, so these are all connected. 
All right, next slide. Yep, this is what it looks like in Maryland. So if you if you were to look at our region, of course we pay the most on electricity. We knew that. We we all live here. So this is just a, a quick snapshot of our average bill versus um, <laughs> versus others. And yes, Susanna, if you are if you watch uh, Netflix in the shower like kudos to you. Sometimes I listen, I listen to the Hamilton soundtrack when I take showers and it drives my husband crazy because he's like, how many times can you listen to the soundtrack? And I'm like, every day, every day. All right. So the website, this is the main thing that I want to make sure y'all know about. The website is montgomeryenergyconnection.org. I do not have enough time to go through the entire website because it's literally 30 websites worth of information. What I will tell you to do is go to this website and then right below where it says your link to energy savings, there's a program finder. So you would put your zip code in, you put if you're a renter or homeowner, commercial is not up to date yet, but once we have commercial, that'll be what you use for your congregation. And then you put in um, how many people are in your home, your zip code, I think I already said that, but your zip code and then your um, income. Now there's a range. The reason, reason why we ask for income, we do not store any of this data, Fawn. I know you like data, but we don't store it. It's just a quick, a quick search engine. Um, and that information is going to tell you because there are certain programs that are income, income qualifying, whether or not you qualify for those. So that's why we ask for income. There it is. There's our program finder. So on the page, you can see it. There's all the information or to the right of every single page. So no matter what page you navigate to, you can always go back to the program finder. And that's going to tell you if there are programs available for you to like uh, for appliance rebates or lighting rebates or quick home energy checkups, which I'm going to get into in a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, there it is. Search results. <laughs> All right. So how can you spend less on your utilities before you press? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> before you press the button, who can tell me what temperature their thermostat is supposed to be set at right now in the winter as it gets colder? Go ahead and unmute yourself. It's all right. 65, 68. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Naomi, I was going to give you extra credit for that 65. <laughs> yeah, it is. 68 degrees. So go ahead. You can yeah. 68 degrees in the winter. I know some of you are like, there's no way, Larissa. Don't worry. I'm not going to come <laughs> to your house and turn off your thermostat. <laughs> we don't have that control. Um, keep it at whatever temperature is comfortable for you, of course. The thing that I want you to be aware of is that for every degree you increase your utility, your, your thermostat, excuse me, it's going to be a 3% increase on your utility bill. Mm -hmm. So that's just something to note. So most of our most of our costs go to heating and cooling our home. It's about 48% of your total cost in your home. And so that's why it gets more expensive in the winter and in the summer when you're using your air conditioner and your heater. So every degree is a 3% increase on your utility bill. So if you like your home at 72 degrees, keep your home at 72 degrees. But when you notice that your utility bill increased 12%, now you know why. Because mm -hmm. four times three is 12. At yeah. least I hope so still. All right. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, another thing that we could do is unplug small appliances. Now, I will tell you, your, your, um, your charger is probably plugged in right here next to you, but your phone's not plugged into it, right? A lot of us have that happening. Or maybe you have your iPad waiting to watch Netflix in the shower. Whatever it is, you're going to make sure that uh, you're unplugging this from the outlet because anything plugged into the outlet is always drawing energy, even if you're not using it. Now, your, your, your cell phone charger costs about 25 cents for the entire year. That is not a lot, but we're talking about cumulative impact. So this is especially important when we talk about congregations and who your congregants are. If every congregant at your congregation has their cell phone plugged in and they're not charging their cell phone, that's 25 cents times however members, many members you have. So that gets to be expensive. That's the same as a vampire? Yes, that's a vampire load. Yep. Vampire anything load. anything that's plugged in but not on, not being utilized. Mm. So coffee makers are big vampires. The biggest vampires in your house or or energy hogs, your microwave and your cable box. What do those two things have in common? They're always plugged in. Well, they're always plugged in, but they're always telling you the time. We use them a lot. 
Yeah. Mm. Well, you don't actually, you probably use your microwave maybe five minutes a day. But you're saying oh, that's yeah. a big deal? That's <laughs> you're using it a lot more system. All right. But um, no, what I'm saying, yes, what I'm saying is it's a big deal. Our cable box and our microwave, there's not much you can do about your cable box. I will tell you reach over here for your cable box you want to have uh, an advanced power strip this you can get through your utility supplier but this advanced power strip the kind you want the reason is because there's a control mechanism so you would plug your tv into this part right here that's a control always on you would have your cable box or your player here and then anything else goes below there the reason why you want to use one of these is because when your tv is off that means that everything above it well, everything below it is off and everything that's always on is taking less energy. Hmm. So that's why we want to use that. And your cable box is always going to tell you the time. Your microwave, though, a lot of them have the setting where you can turn off the clock. And that's a big recommendation. So if you do use your microwave a lot, turn off the clock if, if you have another clock in your house. <laughs> and then the other thing that you can do is switch to LEDs. LEDs are the most energy efficient light bulb out there. If you have incandescent light bulbs or compact fluorescent light bulbs, incandescent light bulbs can be thrown in the trash, get rid of them because you are just wasting money. You are literally just burning money. Incandescent light bulbs use, they heat first and then light second. So 95% of the energy goes to heating that light bulb and 5% goes to actually producing light. Unless you are trying to make s'mores in your house <laughs> Get rid of the incandescents. <laughs> you don't need them. Uh, and so I could tell you that uh, if for a house, a apartment or a home of a two bedroom home, you spend almost $400 a year on lighting if you have incandescent light bulbs. When you switch to LEDs, that goes down to $39 a year. Mm -hmm. So it's a big savings. Yeah. If you have compact fluorescents, those do contain mercury. I know you've had them for a while. They are more energy efficient than incandescents. When they burn out, please do not throw them in the trash. They can only go to three places, Home Depot, Lowe's, or the transfer station. Once we are out of this world of not being able to see each other, you can always schedule, your congregation can schedule a let there be light, light bulb exchange. Mm -hmm. We come to your congregation, we set up a table, people bring us their old incandescent compact fluorescent and light bulbs, and we swap them out for LEDs at no cost. Right. Now we have done those events in October. We did a whole bunch of events that's outside of senior centers because the senior centers are still closed. So if you are planning something in the spring and you want to have like a little bit of like a little bit of social connection, we are more than welcome. We're more than happy to come to your your congregation outside and set something mm -hmm. up. And, right. and it's like a drive by. It's like uh, people, you know, we say we'll be at your congregation between 12 and three and then people mm -hmm. can come and they, it could be contactless too. Yeah. Yes. So if you could save your question. In Hartford, can you, do you go to Hyford, Harvard? I mean, you're in Montgomery. Well, this is Montgomery County only. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You'll have to contact your county uh, reps and see. Yeah, we could look at Hartford. But that's a great. You muted me. Okay, sorry. I can connect, that's okay. I can connect you with the energy person that that's. Oh no, not Hartford County. Dag Navis. She's in Howard County now. But I can help you out. Okay, uh, the other great. thing was the the last one was about LEDs and the different colors they come in because mm -hmm. a lot of folks. I just was at Strassmeyer's last week and someone was like, "I just want a regular light bulb," and I was like, "You don't want an incandescent light bulb. You just want the same color as an incandescent light bulb." And so that's warm, uh, but sunlight, daylight is especially good this time of year if you have seasonal affective disorder or you do anything detail oriented so if you are knitting something for your family member you want you want daylight light bulbs if you are in the kitchen baking delicious cookies daylight if you are doing anything detail oriented you want daylight in that area so just Great. You know. then the last thing i hope it's i think it's the last thing five minutes or less i again no one's going to kick you out, but you do want to take shorter showers. I like to listen to Hamilton. I listen to the first two songs from the Hamilton soundtrack, and then I'm out of there. Mm. So um, that's how I do it. I also have a shower timer, but but yeah, I like to listen to music. 
All right. So what can you do? No matter where you live in the in the state, so Harford County or whatever, there's a, something called a quick home energy checkup. This does not cost you anything. It's a surcharge on your utility bill, so you've already paid for it. But what happens is someone from the utility, a contractor comes to your home, they swap out your light bulbs. Now, I highly recommend this if you have oddly shaped light bulbs, globe light bulbs, chandelier light bulbs, uh, recessed lighting. Let them switch those light bulbs out. If you have regular A-shaped light bulbs, I got everything over here, like these. These are the kind that I swap out at no cost for your congregation. But if you have all, any of the funny shaped ones, when you do the quick home energy checkup, let them know and they'll swap up to 14 of your light bulbs at no additional cost. They'll give you this advanced power strip, no mm -hmm. additional cost. This usually costs $22, $24. They'll also provide you with high efficiency shower heads. Yeah. So when you take that five minute shower, it's less water. They'll give you advanced, they give you um, faucet aerators all at no cost. They yeah. also have a virtual option as well right now. Mm -hmm. So that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. The second thing is the home performance audit. I know we're running out of time. This costs a hundred dollars, but I have to tell you, you have to do this because I just moved into a house in January and I did the audit for a hundred dollars. And I found out that my attic has literally no insulation. So I'm just having, I'm just, I'm, I'm paying for the outdoors to be heated up right now. Wow. Oh um, my goodness. I know it's bananas. And yeah. then, and then once you do the audit, it unlocks $7,500 worth of rebates. So you want to take advantage of this. And then of course, weatherize your home. There are programs that exist um, for income-based programs. But if you live in Montgomery County, sorry, again, this is not Harford County, but in Montgomery County, if you like if you do anything, if you install a programmable thermostat, there's a tax credit available to you. It's $250 tax credit, property tax credit. Again, go to the website, go to help pay my bill or lower my bill. Go to lower my bill and it has all these financing opportunities for you. There's everything I could tell you in 15 minutes about energy, that there's so much more y'all and go to that website because your brain will be like, ah, why? Thank you so much, Larissa. And I'll, uh, you know, brief testimony. I did do that with uh, Pepco, and I got all free uh, shower heads and and bulb replacements, and it, it's great. It's you know, take advantage of it. It's out there. It's free. So yeah. Yeah. So, so I just want to jump in because the chat has been quite active, and yes. we'll share, we're going to share all of the comments in the chat um, following this. Um, but a couple of the things that I wanted to point to is the EPA guide. Um, there was a request for it, and yes, we'll share it after this, um, after the session. Um, uh, Larissa Adat Shalom is interested in um, coordinating a light bulb exchange, so um, keep an eye out for an email from Naomi. Um, yes, yeah, somebody just, somebody emailed me today about an event in this, in January, so I think that's the event. But yeah. yeah, and then, um, so I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Kolya. Um, so that we can have a quick Q and A. Yes, yes. I apologize that we're up against our, our time limit here, but we can we can stay on a few more minutes um, because I know there's folks I invited to uh, be in the room with us who are from organizations, and I did want to just uh, quickly say we've got a new Montgomery County menu for action for congregations uh, that's on our website, and uh, you can go to our resource page and find that because it has all kinds of ideas for you if, in case you're wondering what can you do <laughs> during these times. Um, we, I know we have representatives from uh, Interfaith Power and Light, uh, Maryland Sea Grant, and National Wildlife Federation, and I know we do have Rock Creek Conservancy in the room. So if you could each just introduce yourself with your name and a, and a sentence or two about what you can offer congregations, that would be great. Uh, hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, I'm Joelle with Interfaith Power and Light. It's great to see a lot of friends on the line. Um, we are working with congregations across the region to support their work to address climate change. Um, and so, uh, you know, it very much includes the energy um, work that Larissa shared tonight. But um, we see addressing climate change in a faith community as having sort of three components, education, greening, and advocacy. So we can support your congregation on the journey, um, talking about what is happening to our world, thinking about having speakers and sermons. Um, uh, we have a Lent calendar uh, 
Omer calendar and a Ramadan calendar at the appropriate times of year to walk through um, to walk through the that that season and think about our connection to climate. So that's you know we go we learn and then we go green and we've heard tonight about lots of ways that interfaith partners for the Chesapeake and the Montgomery County programs can help you go green. Um, and we'd love to support um, green teams that are figuring out how to sort of walk the talk, both in their sanctuaries and at home. Um, something we didn't talk about tonight is that we can help congregations um, pursue solar panels for their own facilities. We can help congregations rebid their energy contracts and get 100% renewable energy credits. And we can also support members of congregations um, in doing the shifting to cleaner power at home through either solar panels, uh, subscribing to community solar or supporting wind energy on their energy bills. So we're happy to be a consultant for all of that. Um, and particularly the congregational solar is something we've mm. done a lot of homework to, to, get, um, to get knowledgeable about and we're happy to try to guide you through what can be a very confusing process. Um, and then finally, um, uh, Interfaith Power and Light helps congregations advocate for stronger climate and clean energy policy, because these things all go together. The, the reason, one of the reasons that Montgomery County has wonderful uh, programs and offerings is because um, green activists pass great laws. So um, we see that, that it's all a continuum um, to build the climate movement that we need together. Great, thank you, Joelle. Is uh, Amanda here? Uh, speak with Mar about Marilyn Sea Grant and what you can offer in terms of uh, Water audits and um, assessments. Oh, she, she left. OK, well, I'll just say a shout out for Maryland Sea Grant. And we can connect you with Amanda Rockler uh, about uh, the site assessments that, that we can. Uh, so it's perfectly free for your uh, congregation uh, to uh, get an assessment. And they provide a map of all the places where projects might be installed. Uh, so it's a good starting point if you are thinking about these things. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce Naomi uh, Edelson, who's uh, with National Wildlife Federation, talk about sacred grounds. Thank you. Uh, we have um, a program that we started in this region. And in fact, Adat Shalom is one of the pilot uh, congregations. And we basically, it's a recognition or a certification program for congregations around wildlife habitat. But in Montgomery County, it works beautifully because if you create wildlife habitat using native plants, you're eligible for um, conservation landscaping and rain gardens and the rebate through the DEP. And so we partner with them as well as IPC and IPL and Friends of Sligo Creek right now to basically help congregations do that work. And I know some of you, I think were, we did a lot of workshops before for congregations. And so it's instead of greening the inside of the congregation, it's greening the outside. And there's a lot of different elements of it, but it's a lot of fun to do. And it's a great activity for green teams. And I'm happy to uh, share more. Right now, we have an effort to get 100 homes within the Sligo Creek watershed, which is one of the most degraded in the region, to get 100 homes to put in native plants. And um, so if you're a Sligo Creek area congregation, we would love to uh, have you help spread the word. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Yes. Um, for those of you who may be familiar with the uh, <clears throat> backyard habitat uh, certification uh, from National Wildlife Federation, this is their uh, equivalent for communities of faith, the sacred grounds right. program. So, And I just want to say that saving the rain, that was my idea. That guy. <laughs> Great. And Wonderful. EPA said they would do it. So it was, it's been a nice effort. Great. Thanks, Naomi. Um, and so I know that uh, Elena uh, Smith is with uh, Rock Creek Conservancy, and uh, would you share what um, kind of actions and events you have to offer congregations? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me tonight, too. This has been a really great discussion. Um, so my name is Elena. I work at Rock Creek Conservancy, um, and I'll keep this pretty short, but we have a lot of ongoing volunteer acti activities that are available for folks. Um, we stopped volunteers at the beginning of the pandemic and, you know, took a moment to kind of assess um, safety and update guidelines and things, but we're back in a flow of being able to offer events for people. Um, we do cap participation at all of our events um, at 15 people, um, and it's only activities that can be safely distanced. Um, so we do have ongoing opportunities, and we would love to see you all out in the park. Um, you can 
can find those opportunities at the link that I posted in the chat a few minutes ago um, with our Rock Creek calendar. Um, I will also say we also have volunteer opportunities um, for folks who are not necessarily interested or feel safe yet in terms of getting back together in groups, which is completely understandable. Um, so we have another kind of ongoing service opportunity called socially distant stewardship, where folks can go out um, in a couple of different ways. They can register to do an individual cleanup, which is just going out you know, around your block or in your local green space, bringing a trash bag with you and picking up as you go. Um, there are also opportunities to um, remove English ivy or other invasive plants from your yard, and our website kind of talks you through um, how to safely remove those as well as some of the impacts. Um, you may not think that your you know, quick walk around the neighborhood and picking up that trash has an impact, but it, it really truly does. Um, so you know, there's more information on all of those activities on our website, but I'll leave it there for tonight. Thank you again for having us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do we so before we wrap up, um, there's one last question. Um, uh, Fawn was wondering, Naomi, if you have um, native, um, she says, do your native plants that you suggest have root depths? She's looking for this for um, their bioretention rain gardens. We don't, you mean, do we know which native plants have the longest roots? Is that what you're asking? Well, um, okay, I do the USDA plants database and oh. It's been great. Their characteristics files for the certain species will list root depth. And <clears throat> you know, when you're looking for a rain garden, <clears throat> yeah. you want to plan for the roots that are fibrous to kind of hold that all on the surface area of the soil. And then you want deep roots. And you're not you for the same reason. reason. So we so I've been wondering, I don't see any mid-Atlantic root depths charts. Hmm. I've been looking. I keep asking. Wait, I'm sorry, do you work for USDA? No, no. Um, a park no, naturalist. I don't know either. I think yeah. it's an issue we need to have some uh, universities work on, actually. Mm -hmm. That would be a good thing to do because um, I've also run into that and uh, not exactly what you're saying, but that is a really, I think that would be a really valuable project. There's somebody at, um, who does, a, there's also not a lot of good data on a lot of the stormwater stuff, the rain gardens, as much as I thought. Well, actually, I would yeah. say, no. I do, well, I just yeah. prairie plants, yeah. Yeah. and prairie we plants have a well, plant are listed here. for that. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest. That has a 12 foot root depth, yeah. and it lives a hundred years. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to suggest for the, uh, 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 Fawn, I'm going to suggest that perhaps we could take this conversation offline. Uh, I know oh, yeah, wanna, I, I want to honor the uh, time that folks have committed to this and uh, bring it uh, to a wrap up close and thank all of our speakers. Um, uh, and we do point you to those of you who have not attended our Faithful Green Leaders training. If, uh, you go to this web link and on our, uh, our as of September, brand new website, um, and also how to build your teams. Um, and you'll also find uh, our events page, many events that, that congregations are doing during this time of COVID uh, in spite of the challenges. Um, uh, is there anything else we should add, uh, Anna, before we close it out and, and thank everybody? No, this has been, it's been a really great discussion. So thanks everyone. Um, I think this is a treasure trove of resources. So, and we'll be sharing the recording once, um, once we wrap up. Yeah. All right, thank you one and all for your attending. And um, uh, we look forward to seeing you at one of our future uh, webinars as well. Have a great night.